Working Cows Podcast, Episode 135. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, here with another episode for you, powered by the Global Ag Network. And I'm really excited to welcome world-renowned grazer Ian Mitchell Innes to the show today. Now, we recorded this uh, a few weeks ago before things kind of got crazy and rolling with COVID-19 and all that. And since then, his travel plans have been canceled uh, that he was uh, planning to make through Texas and on up into Wyoming and, and all of that. And I'm not sure if any of those will be fulfilled or not when when things do uh, settle down and, and get back to some, some sense of normal. But for now, uh, we know that uh, definitely his some of his his events that he had scheduled for this spring and summer are not going to happen. But in any case, Ian is a legendary South African grazer who's been traveling extensively and sharing uh, what he has learned. I really appreciate uh, Ian's perspective and his humility and his commitment to lifelong learning and uh, really looking forward to asking him a whole bunch of questions, many of which have been submitted to me by my uh, private Facebook group, The Working Cows Mob. Uh, At the end of this episode, I am going to share some thoughts on how we face uh, uncertain times and uh, this is basically what it, what you're going to get at the end of this episode is my uh, take on the Easter story as told to us from Luke chapter 24 and how that relates to our own uncertain times and some channels of communication that we can open up during uncertain times to uh, deal with those things. So, uh, one of my <laughs> favorite reviews of the Working Cows podcast on Apple Podcasts is um, great content minus the evangelizing. And uh, basically goes on to say, if I wanted to be evangelized, I would go find a Christian podcast. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, minus the evangelizing is not going to happen. <laughs> Uh, it isn't there every episode. It isn't explicit every episode, but uh, ultimately Jesus is Lord of every square inch of the universe. That means he's Lord of all of my time and this podcast, and I want to take an opportunity and maybe serve you a little bit with a piece of scripture that I think speaks very poignantly to our own situation. So, uh, I invite you to stick around. I invite with you to interact and uh, and respond to that content at the end of this episode. But for now, we are going to welcome Ian Mitchell Innes to the Working Cows podcast. Really excited to have him. Ian, thanks for joining me today. Pleasure, Clay. We've been trying to hook up for some time and it hasn't been possible, but at last we are talking to each other. Yes, uh, very much appreciate that. Uh, I was in the middle of moving last year when you were here for your, uh, I don't know if it's an annual tour, but uh, for your, your tour around the United States. And uh, so we didn't, we didn't get it done, uh, but I'm really excited to have you now. And uh, I guess uh, let's, just, let's just start there. Um, what are some of the things that you are teaching as you travel around. Uh, you've got another trip coming up, and we'll have links to that in the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 135. Uh, you've got another trip coming up. What are some of the, the things that you will be covering uh, in some of the schools that you are are going to be putting on here in the United States over the summer of 2020? Well, Clay, from my learning that has happened over the last 14, 15 years that I've been going to America each year and doing schools or workshops and consulting with people, I have changed the way I look at grazing cattle and really 
I don't want to get into an argument with anybody. So my approach is totally different from anybody else. I do believe and I understand that energy is the elusive part of the equation to achieve animal performance. So really, if you take that to its limit, land is a solar panel, and the species of grass that grow on that solar panel will dictate the efficiency of the solar panel. Hmm. Now, fortunately, nature knew that we were going to mess up. (laughs) And so the seeds of those grasses that we need, which at the moment are not present in our swath, are still in the ground. And all we have to do is change the environment at soil surface level. And that will enable us to improve the efficiency of our solar panel, the land. Wherever I go in the world, I'm having farmers, ranchers tell me that they're carrying half or less than half the number of livestock on their properties that their forefathers kept. Hmm. And that is the situation which has caused farmers and ranchers not to make a return on their investments. So all I do is change the way they graze or suggest they change the way they graze using ultra-high density, moving animals, but at the same time achieving animal performance without putting inputs or having to spend money on inputs rather. And that has been extremely successful. So one of the things that I've learned in the process of producing this podcast is that we tend to get a postcard image in our mind of what a certain place, country, region in the world looks like. And I guess I've been to South Africa, but only in Johannesburg. I never got to look at the landscape. So uh, could you tell me a little bit about what your part of the world is like uh, as far as uh, grass types and rainfall and weather patterns? Yes, We live in an area which is just below the Drakensberg, and we call the tall grass felt area, where we have 30 inches plus minus 28 to 30 inches of rain a year, and we grow huge amounts of grass. So traditionally what happens is farmers, ranchers will burn the grass off at the beginning of spring each year, and in doing so will allow the green to come through and then run their cattle on the green. But since changing and using holistic management principles and holistic management plan grazing, I grew so much grass that I lost animal performance. Hmm. And in doing so, I teamed up with Mark Bader of Free Choice Enterprises. And between he and I, we worked out that really I had far too much land. So I leased out two-thirds of my property and worked Hmm. on a third with all the cattle that would be on the whole property. And immediately I started to get results. So from that, I developed the principles of land as a solar panel. And we use livestock to harvest the energy from our solar panel. And in doing so, we need to graze the grass wherever you are in the world. We graze the species of grass that you have in a vegetative stage. Because in a vegetative stage, the amount of energy that is available to the animal is optimal. And we ranchers know, and we've seen it time and time again, if you watch a herd of animals go into a pasture, they will come in and they will take a bite off the top of the grass. And they will continue to do that in time-controlled areas until most plants have had one bite off before they go down and take the second bite. So they are harvesting the energy. And in doing so, we are not eating the plant so low that it takes time for it to recover. With the result is the recovery periods need to be a bit shorter because we graze the grass in a vegetative stage. And in doing so, leaving plenty behind, but having trodden some on the ground, So the soil becomes covered, you're sequestrating carbon, you're putting litter on the ground, 
protecting it from the sun and the wind. And so in terms of what actually happened, energy is money, money is energy, time is money, and water is money. Now, all of those things affect how many units of energy you're going to harvest from your solar panel. And as numbers increase, so your land improves and you harvest more energy from the sun, and ultimately there's more money left in your pocket. Now, this is nothing new because nature has been doing it all these years <laughs> prior to us putting up the first fence. And the minute we put the first fence up and animals stopped migrating, we then grew so much grass that we couldn't use it or didn't have the animals to eat the grass and to do what nature wanted. So all I'm talking about is the closer we mimic and follow nature, the more money is going to be left in our pockets. Hmm. Yes, appreciate that very much. Um, so what is the difference then uh, between uh, selective and non-selective grazing? Uh, how are you defining those terms? Well, there has been a lot of argument in terms of what I'm suggesting is a selective grazing, but there are various types of selective, selective grazing. So, for instance, People will say what people, what ranchers and farmers do traditionally where they put animals in a paddock and leave them there for a year is selective grazing. <laughs> yes, it is, but it is not planned selective grazing. What I do is a planned selective grazing. So you put animals in at high de density to enable the animals to take one bite of most plants and basically shred what is left behind and a third of what is trodden on the ground will stand up again within three to four days mm. and that plant never stops growing. So the capture of energy improves and is quicker and your recovery period will be shorter. So you can come back and harvest energy again in say 18 to 20 days in our sort of the world where the traditional would be a 30-day recovery period before people would graze the paddock. Mm -hmm. Whereas non-selective grazing, you put animals in and you graze it or tread it at a density where everything is flattened right into the ground. Now, what happens then is you lose animal performance. Now, I don't think there are many ranchers in the world who can afford to buy supplements to keep the animals alive while they're improving the land. Things have got so severe on the ranches that we need people on the land. So if we can get people living on the land, earning a reasonable income, they then automatically, as the animal numbers increase, will then improve the soil and the species of grasses will change as the soil improves. So it's an ongoing basis, but, but we have to save the rancher farmer first hmm. before we can save the world. Right. <laughs> I appreciate that. I was recently, or last summer, I guess it was, at the Ranching for Generations conference hosted by uh, Ranch Management Consultants, the company that puts on the Ranching for Profit School in the States, and uh, they were talking about the difference between Stan Parsons and Alan Savory, and the statement was made that Alan Savory wants to save the world, and Stan Parsons wants to save your ranch, and that was kind of the, the difference between the two philosophies, and I think both are necessary, and both are very helpful, uh, but I think kind of what you're talking about is let's take care of the individual first and then we'll move to the broader context. Correct. There are too many people on the land not getting a proper return on their time and or their investment in land. We need to sort that out first because the rest will happen if we can get them to have a reasonable livelihood. Sure. So I guess one of the things that I would like to drill down a little bit on that you have brought up is this idea of grazing the plant while it's in a vegetative state. Uh, how often should 
the goal be to do that? We'll say maybe as a percentage of the growing season, just so that we can talk a little bit more broadly than just an individual's context. Um, how often should we be seeking or for what percentage of the growing season should we be seeking to graze the plants on our land in a vegetative state? As each area, depending on heat units and rainfall, will be different. I've just come back from New Zealand where they graze the grass into the ground, <laughs> okay? And I've got clients now who are doing what I have just suggested. They're taking one bite of most plants and eating it in a vegetative stage. So the recovery period compared to what they have been doing is slightly longer. But what happens is the species of grass changes from a rye grass to a mixed clover grass species the seeds are still in the ground from when those plants were originally there. And so what happens is, for instance, in New Zealand, they have lengthened the recovery period to let the grass grow and so leave a residual which is built during the summertime. Now, you can imagine if a, a tuft of grass is growing or a clover, a legume is growing, and just the top is taken off, and you come back in 15 to 20 days' time, and again, you just one bite off the top. Your residual is getting longer and longer, and that will be your stockpile to graze during the non-growing season. You do not need to make bales. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, uh, that's very good. So how do you uh, decide what the proper density is given uh, the different seasons of the year? Uh, how are you making the decision uh, when and, and where to be at what density? So the density is a, is a factor of the ability of the rancher or the farmer to have his animals bunched. So in terms of getting onto a property, I will say to the person, I don't want you to buy any fencing or change anything. Use what you have as long as you have enough drinking water to put all the animals you have into a single herd. Move that herd around the property. And in doing so, you will be growing so much grass that in actual fact, to get back in the right recovery period to graze the species you have in the vegetative stage, you will have to only use half your property. Hmm. So what I suggest is that rancher farmers use the best half of their property, use the existing paddocks, have the animals in one herd, move them around the property, grazing as I have just suggested, and the security or the removal of risk is that you've got the other half of the property which is now recovering while you're grazing your best part. If you run into a drought, you can start using other paddocks as you go around. And as cattle numbers or livestock numbers increase, you then start using the whole property. Or you can lease out what you don't use after a year or two because land is a solar panel and you need to get the money from your solar panel, the energy from your solar panel to pay you. You don't want to leave land idle and not get any money for it. Should we be running a specific type of cow breed, etc., if we are going to be successful in grazing? And that uh, question comes from John Coleman Locke, who will be hosting one of your schools this summer. Yes, well, in terms of what type of animal do you use, there are no good animals or bad animals. There are only good and bad people who've changed animals to try and suit what they want. They've made them big, they've made them small, they've made them long, they've made them tall. There are animals which are suited, better suited for certain areas. And if you can start with the right animal when you start, you are far better off and will do a better job. So I don't believe there's a particular breed that is any better than any other breed because there are big animals within the breed and small animals within the breed. But if you're in an area that is capturing very little energy, so if you're measuring the bricks in your grasses and you've only got two bricks, you definitely don't need big animals because they won't survive. 
So the smaller the animal, in fact, at two bricks, you should only be running sheep or maybe goats. At eight bricks in your grasses, you can be running cattle. And at 15 bricks in your grasses, your cattle will do extremely well. And in fact, form follows function. And the size of your cows will be bigger than somebody who's got five bricks. Alyssa Falamir, uh, Fernando Falamir's wife, says uh, she would like to hear you talk about year-round calving. Uh, what is the what are what are your thoughts on that? Pros and cons. Year-round calving is a very difficult thing because you need to watch what the wild animals do. The closer you are to the equator, the more year-round calving will succeed. The further away you go from the equator, the more seasonal it becomes, and you need to carve in the right period or right time for that latitude. Are you with me? Yes. So I guess I would like to circle back around a little bit on the uh, getting started. Um, And if I understood you right, you would... You're talking about using water to move them to different places uh, rather than using a lot of fencing infrastructure that you could just move your water around and and let them move around in that way if you can keep them in a herd. Is that right? Well, the obvious, the best would be herding, but we can only do that in Africa (laughs) where we've got people to herd animals. And I'm involved in numerous herds where There is no fencing on the whole property because of wildlife like elephant and lion and things. So fences don't survive. Now, in a situation like that, your water would be the central point and you graze in a concentric circle around that water until you're on the outside. And then when the land closest to the water is now starting to lose its vegetative stage, you go back to that ground and you graze it again, and you keep improving the soil by grazing your best land, which in this case would be around the water, until you improve the species, which will change over time, because all life needs energy. Now, life in the soil is no different from anything else. Mm. And the ways of getting energy through the soil surface to give life to the soil There are three ways of doing it. The action of grazing, and there's a shock of energy that goes down the plant when it is grazed and then feeds the biota in the soil. Mm. The second type of energy is not documented, and I call it kinetic energy, and that is the energy that goes from the hooves of the animals through the soil surface and excites the biota in the soil. Mm. And the third type of energy I call symbiotic energy, which again is not documented, And that is the magnetic field around every mammal. Now, if you get 2,000 animals together, that magnetic field is massive. And it does not stop at the soil surface, but goes into the soil and will stimulate soil life. Now, ranchers can prove this to themselves by just making a, a, a narrow paddock across the existing paddock and driving all the animals through that walkway. They Mm. don't have to graze, they just have to walk. And the change that will take place inside that walkway will be totally different from what happens outside that walkway. And that is proof that something has happened just by walking the animals through there. So we feed the soil, and as we feed the soil, we change because what goes on the soil is a mirror image of what is in the soil. And we can manipulate the fungal bacteria relationship in the soil to grow the plants that we so desire, and we can manage our pastures accordingly. But animals plant grass. So the higher the density, the better chance you have of changing the species back to what they used to be in that particular environment. Now, obviously, every environment is different depending on temperature and rainfall, as I've already said. Mm-hmm. So is there is there hope or the possibility of testing kinetic and symbiotic en- energy, if I understood you correctly? Well, you can test it by just seeing what happens on the land. Mm-hmm. For instance, there's a rancher in Oklahoma that had rehabilitated half his ranch 
and he is a deer farmer. He ranches deer. And when he wanted to rehabilitate the rest of the ranch, I told him just to use his intern to make walkways. In other words, the cattle ate a sufficient belly full on pastures that were already rehabilitated through animal impact and just walk them across the rest of the pasture. And the difference in six months was huge. It mm. looked as though he had gone in with a fertilizer truck and fertilized the ground. What are some global grazing trends in management uh, that you see? Um, yeah, what, are, what, are you, what have you seen in your travels uh, as far as trends in grazing and management? Well, many of the trends are to let the plant seed. And the trouble is when it seeds, the energy goes into the seed and back into the roots of the plant to prepare it for the next season, and you've lost the energy. So when you're harvesting energy or when you are eating in a vegetative stage, you harvest the energy at its optimal time within the plant. And one of the opening things I said was energy is the elusive part of the equation mm. to achieve animal performance. So we need to get maximum energy. Protein is not short. There's plenty of protein, except sometimes in the winter, particularly on land that has been burnt. We have minimal protein in our stockpile. But if you have vegetative grass through the summer, you take one bite off it. The grass that is grown with animal impact through the grain season will be extremely nutritious mm. in the non-grain season. In fact, the nutrition will be better than baled grass. So even even if it's allowed after that that first grazing or after the growing season grazing, however many passes that ends up being, uh, it will be better nutritionally uh, as a as a standing forage than it would be, say, in in a bale or in a windrow or or anything like that. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. I have a client who insisted on having bales because he maintained that on his property, it froze. It's in America. And he had to have these bales for when he had this freeze, ice on the ground. Mm -hmm. Anyway, over a period of years, he was having good stockpile and his cattle were grazing stockpile and he had a freeze. So he went out with the bales, fed the bales and then move the fence for the cattle to get a new section of stockpile. The animals left the bales, and they were excellent bales. <laughs> they left the bales, ate the stockpile, and came back and lay down on the bales. That's what they thought of the bales. <laughs> yeah, good betting. Today, 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 he does not buy any bales. Hmm. Uh, what are some of the, the key ways to manage energy uh, in, in the growing season? so that you can improve uh, the standing forage in the dormant season? Use it or lose it. <laughs> As you, I've explained, use the energy or lose the it. Yes, if you don't use the energy, you lose it because it goes into the seed and back into the ground. Right. And when I talk about energy, I'm talking about hydrocarbons. I'm talking about hydrogen as true energy. We humans send rockets to the moon <laughs> using energy as a fuel. And that energy, that hydrogen, is the fuel, in fact, the energy that livestock need to stimulate the bacteria in the rumen. You must understand that when we feed a cow, we're not feeding the cow. We're stimulating the bacteria, mm. which breaks down the roughage that is available to that cow. I mean, how often have we seen animals in the middle of winter standing in belly high grass, not grazing it at 10 o'clock in the morning? And the left-hand side is showing signs of not getting a full belly because the bacteria have not got enough energy to multiply. Mm. The bacteria tells the brain, don't bring in any more of this food, which then tells the mouth the animal can't graze. Mm. But if you stimulate with energy, and fortunately we can do that if we run into that situation with energy supplementation in the form of a block, we then stimulate the bacteria. The bacteria breed, tell the brain, bring it on, chaps. We can use it. We can break it down. <laughs> You've mentioned um, some fairly cutting-edge things that I think, in my understanding, um, have really been coming to the forefront in the last 
several years, maybe a decade at the most, uh, some of the understanding of rumen and how it works and some of the understanding of the soil microbial uh, community and how they are working and how they are resp- responding. Uh, has that been things you've learned simply by uh, observation? Have there been uh, classes and continuing education that you have attended yourself? Uh, w- what has been the source of that understanding for you? My my original learning started with Mark Bader of Free Choice Enterprises, who is a nutritionist, mm. and he helped me understand what happened in the rumen. I've done classes with Elaine Ingham. I believe a lot in Elaine Ingham's work in terms of fungal bacterial relationships in the soil, and we can manipulate all those. Everything I talk about is actually relatively simple. It's just a matter of understanding when and where to use certain densities and times of grazing throughout the year. So you monitor, the only thing you really need to monitor is the animal. Hmm. You need to get maximum animal performance at all times throughout the year. That is where the money is. (laughs) And when you've made the money and increased livestock, we then have the ability to improve land and do what needs to be done. But we've got to save the rancher, farmer on the land first. Are, are most uh, places best served by a year-round herd? Or are there environments in the world that you've been to that you would say are too brittle to have cows year-round? Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of people would say, and and you can tell me if you agree or disagree with this, that one of the keys to profit in this industry is matching the carrying capacity to the stocking rate. Uh, so, is are, are most places served with the best with a year round herd? And then, do you agree with the idea of profit being connected to matching carrying capacity to stock density? Well, obviously, you've got to match the number of animals to the amount of food you have. But what I said earlier, most ranchers and farmers I talk to, they are running less livestock than their parents or their grandparents did 50 to 100 years ago. We've done something wrong. We have implemented policies which are scientifically proven, okay, for the last 150 years. Mm. Now, it has been extremely good in developing computers and developing mechanics and sending people to the moon because it is all linear. We humans are superb at any linear thinking. But the minute we come to the environment and agriculture, which is complex, multidimensional, we have failed miserably. So I'll Mm. go as far as to say that 99.9% of what is scientifically proven is faulty. I'm not saying it's wrong. But if it's linear, it will be faulty because we're dealing with something that is totally complex. Hmm. If something is scientifically proven, it's got to be replicated over and over again before it's accepted that it is scientifically proven. We on the land are dealing with chaos. How do you replicate chaos? You can't. (laughs) So we need to look at things differently. If we look at the environment and agriculture, it's holes within holes with interconnecting parts. Mm. So if you fiddle with a part, you're going to affect the whole, whereas science is reductionist theory and only looks at the part. And this is where we've gone wrong. And only nature has known how to work it out. And really holistic management being a decision-making process, in my, in my understanding of it, is the only decision-making process that can take this complex, multidimensional situation, the environment or agriculture, break it down into a linear format that we can make a relative decision after investigating, put it back together again, and make a decision understanding the whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate that, looking at it. Primarily holistic management, that is, as a decision, decision-making decision framework. I, I really appreciate that. Correct. What, as, as you've traveled around, uh, can you talk about some of the most challenging environments that you've been in and some of the results that uh, your 
methods, if I can use that term, have uh, produced in some of those those difficult environments? Yes, well, some of the, the most difficult environments have been near deserts that I've come across. And once we've been able to get animals to get something to eat and increase the stock density, as I mentioned earlier, animals plant grass. So as you get the densities up, the more grasses you're going to plant and the whole environment changes. So 10 years ago, I got to a ranch and my wife looked at me and smiled and said, this is going to be fun. What are you going to tell this guy? Because there was no grass. 10 years down the line, it is totally grass and his cattle are fat and he is running four to five times the animals that he had originally. And that to me is profit. The value of an animal decreases with the increased numbers you can carry per acre. Could you talk a little bit more about that, about what what kind of the methods are? Are the methods the same? I mean, from, from the desert to uh, a more uh, higher rainfall environment, are they using the same ideas in, in these different places, uh, just in, in different ways of implementing them? The principles are similar. But the problem in the desert is you've got nothing to feed the animal. So to get densities is extremely difficult. But as you can get densities, and that's why I urge and recommend that people start with the best 50% of their property, use what animals they have, and move out from there in concentric circles and rehabilitate the whole property. You've got to get animal performance first and foremost. That is the money. It's all about the money. (laughs) You've got to make money. Absolutely. Uh, That's what's keeping families on the land. And as I understand it, you have uh, been through a transition on your ranch with uh, your son uh, taking over or or being more heavily involved in management. Can you talk about uh, how that happened and, and some of the things that you learned in that process? Yes, I don't particularly want to use the situation that we've been in because we live in a country where there's government interference in policies and principles, what you can do and what you can't do. So in terms of what has happened, we've used the decision-making process, holistic management decision-making process, to understand what we have to do to make sure that the family finances continue to move forward and at the same time accommodating situations that the government want us to do. So we have leased out our solar panel, a lot of our land, to other people because we've got to get a return from that solar panel. And our son has put up six center pivots because we had to use our water rights or lose them. Hmm. And so he is growing crops. We've reduced the cattle numbers. But gradually, as he perfects the growing of crops, we gradually increasing cattle numbers. And in a matter of another five years, we'll take back the whole ranch and run it as an entity. At that stage, then it'll be our son plus other people helping him to manage. Because for one person to manage all the cropping and the cattle, it's too much. I've got a couple of questions here from the private Facebook group about uh, altering densities, uh, when and where and why. you would use different densities in different places. And I think we've maybe touched on that a little bit. Uh, But could you talk about some of the different ideas and and ways you would go about making the decision as to what density, when and where and why? Well, to start with, you must understand that if you've got two herds and you put them together, you've automatically doubled the amount of food on that property, okay? (laughs) Because you have more land (laughs) harvesting energy. If you start talking about grazing grasses, you'll get complicated and miss the point. So if you are harvesting energy, you put two herds together, you've got double the energy available on your solar panel. If you have six herds at the moment and you put six herds together, you have got six times the energy available because all those other five paddocks that used to have animals in that were nibbling at the energy all the time are harvesting energy. And that is why when I get onto a ranch, I recommend to people that they use the best 50% 
of their ranch because that's really what their stocking rate should be, hmm. using all the animals that they have on the existing ranch. And that is the beginning. What is it that has continued to drive you uh, to teach and to uh, put on workshops and to travel and to uh, go to different places and, and talk about these things? Having been in a situation where I nearly went broke because I lost animal performance, I was a successful beef farmer before doing holistic management. I did holistic management. I grew so much grass that my cattle died in grass and I couldn't find the cattle the grass was so tall. <laughs> so having come from a position of a situation of not having any money and worked through that until we back to getting animal performance, it has become my passion to help people living on the land to realize their ambitions. And in doing so, I'm meeting fantastic people. I'm learning on a continual basis myself. And as I learn, I add it to my repertoire and teach people what I've learned. And that's why I continue to do what I'm doing. And could you talk a little bit more about some of the mistakes uh, that came along the way and, and how you use them as learning opportunities? Yeah, well, the biggest mistake is to <clears throat> not harvest the energy so you don't get animal performance. <laughs> And if you look at the ground and expect to change species and improve the ground and you're not worried about the cattle, you will go broke for sure. Hmm. There's no doubt about it. It's not if, it's when. And so one has to concentrate on that harvesting of energy. And I'll repeat it again because it is so important. Energy is the elusive part of the equation to achieve animal performance. If you get the energy the oxygen, hydrogen, and protein, which I was taught by Mark Bader, the rumen of an animal is like a combustion engine. Mm. It's got oxygen, which is burns the energy and the protein to enable metabolism to function optimally. If your metabolism functions optimally, your animals are healthy, your immune system holds, the cattle breed, and everything happens correctly. If you try and save the world by looking at the ground and changing the cover and the species, you will go broke. Hmm. Do you see that the places that are implementing these things, and, and specifically, uh, I think maybe your main paradigm challenge here today is to look at the animal uh, first and, and concentrate on animal performance. Do you see that people who are implementing these ideas are seeing increasing diversity on their places of, of, the, of the species of grass and, and plants and, and those things? What is interesting is that people who have been following me for 10 years or more, and I go to them every year and consult with them, they are growing more grass because that's what they want. Okay. So you plan with what you have. The species you have, you must understand those species, determine the recovery period for those species that you have to be able to come back and eat them in a vegetative stage. As that improves and you're getting animal performance, the species will change to grasses that you've probably never seen in your life, <laughs> and they'll be capturing more energy. So your solar panel captures more energy which enables you to keep more animals because understand that a cow can overeat by 40% to try and rectify a problem. In other words, a lack of energy or protein mm. or whatever. So if you reduce her intake by 40% and she's still healthy and putting on weight, what more do you want? You've immediately enabled your ranch to hold 40% more livestock. Mm. That is money. Mm-hmm. So in managing the whole and understanding for livestock that you've got to, you can just monitor livestock. You don't have to monitor anything else. The rest will happen. Species will change. You will be manipulating the fungal bacterial relationship in the soil because fungal ground grows trees. Bacterial <laughs> ground grows grasses. <laughs> but we want grass plus legume, so we need a fungal bacterial relationship of one-to-one. -one. Mm. Then our cattle do extremely well, and we can do that with no inputs. 
And and when you talk we, about inputs, you're talking uh, chemical and um, supplementation uh, with as far as uh, protein or, or or energy supplements. Correct. We we as humans are taught from kindergarten to send our money to town. <laughs> So we keep on buying inputs, all the adverts, open any newspaper or magazine, mm. it's full of adverts, how a farmer can improve his situation by sending his money to town. How can that happen? We're in the situation we are because the money's in town. Mm. If energy is money and money is energy, we should be the wealthiest people in the community. Mm. If you tell people in town that you're a farmer or a rancher, now they laugh at you because we, we are the poor people in the community. Hmm. Because we have sent all the money to town, understand that all wealth comes from the sun. If all wealth comes from the sun, we should be wealthy. But we are manipulated to send it to town because we need a bailer, we need a tractor, we need herbicides, we need all this junk, which we don't need. Hmm. Before man put up the first fence, livestock never had any supplementation. Hmm. Form followed function, and they the survival of the fittest. And that's what we should be doing with our livestock. Could you talk a little bit about your perspective on how pesticides that attack internal parasites in cows uh, impact the soil? Yeah, well, they all are poison and they kill the soil. I mean, if it's going to kill life in the gut, a parasite, which is life in the gut, Mm -hmm. it's going to kill life in the soil as well. That's common sense. Sure. So avoid them if possible. I'm not saying go cold turkey, but one can. And for instance, in New Zealand, we organized recovery periods where the cattle grazed first. We then had a short recovery period for the sheep to come in afterwards, and then a long recovery period before the cattle came back. And if you added those recovery periods up, it killed the parasites for the sheep and the parasites for the cattle. Hmm. And you didn't have to use drenching material to get rid of worms because you had no worms. And not only that, you're grazing the tops of the plants. You're not grazing down into the swath where all the parasite eggs are. Could you talk about finding animals that are fit for your environment and adapted to your environment? Is that a a function of changing your management and they'll show up? Or what what is your perspective on that? You can use observation, form will follow function, And the animal born on the property will be your best animal, best adapted animal to your grazing. I'm told that at conception, the fetus knows which grasses it should eat. (laughs) So if that is the case, and the further we travel to go and buy a a bull now, the better the bull. Is Is that perception or reality? That's perception. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> um, but I don't want to get into that discussion here. <laughs> okay. Could you talk a little bit about your, your planned trip to the United States uh, this summer, uh, some of the places that you'll be going and where people can, can find you and uh, how they can get in touch and, and make plans to be where you're going to be? Well, basically, I get into the United States in the beginning of April. And because I don't like snow or cold weather, (laughs) I start in Texas. (laughs) And we move through the United States and end up in Wyoming at the beginning of July. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, throughout the United States, I'm doing schools, workshops. And between the schools and workshops, I'm doing on-ranch consultations. And they will be available on the internet or wherever, various places, it'll be posted. And for quite a few years, you have been uh, at Greg Judy's place uh, for grazing schools there in Missouri. And I see that you guys have added a second school May 21st through the 23rd of 2020. Correct. Greg is one of my oldest clients. Hmm. And he's been exceptional in doing what I recommended and suggested. And he has succeeded and done extremely well. And um, his first school, we don't like getting too many people, and even the 100 is almost too many people, but he's opened up a second school because people want to come and see and hear what he's doing. Thank you very much, Clay. I appreciate it. Thanks, you.
Got a bunch of exciting stuff coming up in the future of the Working Cows podcast. I have recorded episode 150 with uh, a very special guest, a returning guest. Uh, there was probably a hint about that or an explicit uh, ex. ex- uh, explicit sharing of who that guest was uh, a few episodes back if you caught that. But anyways, I'm excited about that uh, opportunity. Uh, so keep tuning in to the Working Cows podcast. Keep sharing it. Uh, back catalog of episodes. All of it is accessible at workingcows.net slash episodes, or you can just simply share ranchingpodcast.com. That is singular ranching podcast.com. And uh, people can check it out there. The whole back episode of uh, 135 plus episodes, back catalog of 135 plus episodes. So please do that. And now I wanted to share, as I said uh, in the intro, this um, piece of the story of the resurrection of Jesus. And this is what I shared at Prairie Home Church, the church I pastor uh, on. Easter Sunday morning at our sunrise service, uh, we talked about this particular passage because I felt like it kind of spoke uh, very clearly to what we are facing as far as uncertainty is concerned in our own world. And so uh, I'm going to read this passage. It's a fairly uh, lengthy passage, but uh, I will read this passage and then I'd like to just share a few uh, channels that I think are opened up or that we have the opportunity to open up uh, as we walk through channels of communication that we have opportunity to open up as we walk through uncertain times. So before I read this, though, um, this is God's Word, so I'd like to ask Him uh, for His help in understanding it. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for today, and we thank You for an opportunity to look into your word, and we pray that as we examine your word, Lord, that you would examine us and that we would come to a clear understanding of who you are as we look at this word that you inspired for us to to understand and to know. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who inspired this word to be written, and we pray that as we read this word that the same Holy Spirit that inspired it to be written would open our eyes and our ears and our minds and our hearts that we might see and hear and know and understand what it is you have to say to us today. We thank you for Jesus who sends us the Holy Spirit, and we pray in his name. Amen. So, as I said, um, Luke chapter 24, we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 35, a lengthy portion of scripture, but a very uh, important record of the resurrection event and also some some things that I think we can pull out for our own time, the own, our own uncertainty that we're dealing with. The Word of God says this, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, that is, the angels, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna Mary, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now behold, two of them were traveling, and this is portion That I focused on on Sunday morning. Now, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. 
but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened these days, there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and the word before and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive, and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, that is Jesus speaking, O foolish ones and slow of heart, to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is now toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to, to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they arose, so they rose up that very hour, and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven, those who were with them, gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. This is God's word. So, just to set the context a little bit, it's a very... uh, troubling time for these disciples who are walking on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they had found themselves kind of wrapped up in all that was going on in the ministry of Jesus and really hoping that Jesus was the one, as they said, to redeem Israel. They were hoping that he was going to be the one who would take the boot of the Roman government off the neck of the Jewish people. The Roman government was an oppressive occupying force and an unwelcome force in the area of Judea and in the region of Israel, and they were there and they were not welcome, but the Jews were not capable, though they had tried multiple times, of throwing off that uh, unwelcome force. And so, these these people had gotten wrapped up in the ministry of Jesus, and they had been looking for this Messiah. They had been looking for one that would come and would come in on a white horse with a sword drawn and free them from the captivity that they were experiencing, free them from the political oppression that they were experiencing. And so there was some things in Jesus's ministry that indicated that he might be that guy. Well, Jesus didn't come on a white horse, and Jesus didn't come uh, with his sword drawn. Jesus came as a as a humble marginalized Galilean peasant. Jesus came uh, not as a king, but as a servant. Jesus, in fact, had just a few days earlier washed his disciples' feet, one of the lowliest tasks in all of the ancient Near Eastern culture, and had had shown them his style of leadership and serving them and, and, and blessing them in that way. And so, Jesus wasn't quite everything that they were hoping he would be in in the realm of a political savior but he was a spiritual savior in his first incarnation when he came uh, ultimately uh, born of a virgin in in Bethlehem uh, born as a man growing up in the house of Mary and Joseph and 
uh, going going on to live the perfect life that we all should have lived, and and then ultimately to die the death that we all deserve for all of the imperfections in our life. And so Jesus wasn't this political savior, where where he comes in, as I said, on a white horse with a sword drawn. In fact, he comes in on a donkey. He comes in uh, in in showing that he's coming to uh, make peace with the people of God, and ultimately. We understand from the rest of the New Testament that he was making peace between God and man, and that he was not necessarily coming to make peace with the Roman government or to make peace with the Jewish establishment, but to make peace between God and man. And so they were they were thinking he was the one to redeem Israel, but he wasn't. And so I think we should put ourselves in the shoes of these disciples and think a little bit about or he wasn't the one to redeem Israel as they thought he would be, I should say. Uh, they, he was the one to redeem Israel ultimately, uh, spiritually, but physically and politically, not quite how they had pictured him. And so, But I, I do think, as I was saying, it's important for us to, to put ourselves in their shoes, to think a little bit about what was going through the heads of these disciples, these followers of Jesus, these learners of the way of Jesus. And they were they were dealing with some very difficult things. I mean, Jesus had spent the last week of his life really bringing to a head a lot of the conflicts that he had had with the Jewish establishment for uh, the the many years or the three years of his ministry prior to that, and he he accomplished some things uh, in the way of of uniting two groups that really couldn't get along very well. The Sanhedrin was this collection of the Pharisees and the Sadducees together, the ruling council of the Jewish people, and and they didn't like each other. I mean, they liked each other even less than Republicans and Democrats like each other now, and and they they couldn't come together on very many things, but they did come together on the fact that they didn't like Jesus and that they were uh, worried about Jesus's endangering their ability to uh, make money and their ability to uh, control the people. And so he spent this last week of his life really bringing to a head a lot of the conflicts that he had had. If you look at the last 12 chapters, or last nine chapters, excuse me, from chapter 9 on in the book of John, that's that's the last week of Jesus' life. Chapter 12 is the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, and, and it goes on into chapter 20 being the crucifixion, and 21 being the resurrection, and the Great Commission, and all those things. And so uh, you see the 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 last week of Jesus's life in in pretty good detail there and there's there's conflict after conflict with the Jewish establishment and so and I I don't say that to to cast the Jewish establishment in a negative light I just say that to say that these disciples are now <laughs> without a leader in this uh, in the in the grip of the power of the Jewish establishment, and and not only did Jesus get the Jewish establishment together to agree that they were they were going to murder Jesus, he also uh, got the Jewish establishment, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, to conspire together with the Roman government, who they liked less than they liked each other, to have Jesus murdered because they weren't capable of carrying out the death penalty they had to get Pontius Pilate to do uh his to do the the carrying out of the actual death penalty and so they they uh conspired together with the Roman with the Roman government to murder Jesus and so here's the disciples they've been in Jerusalem for a week with Jesus as he brings to a head a lot of these conflicts that he's had with the Roman uh, with the Romans and with the Jews, and now he's gone. He has died, and they are still under the impression that he's dead and that they're very vulnerable uh, to whatever the Jewish establishment and the Roman government decide to do with this small, uh, marginalized sect of uh, the Jewish population that was following Jesus at that time. And so I mean, this is the ultimate power of the Roman government and the Jewish establishment coming against them. And so they are in a, in a heap of uncertainty, and they are 
dealing with all of this going on, just to kind of set the stage, not to cast any one particular group as responsible or in a negative light, but just to say, this is the situation that they found themselves in. Very, very uncertain times. Uh, there's been lots of conflict, lots of uh, threats, and and ultimately the carrying out of the murder of Jesus. And so now, here's where they find themselves. Without a leader, vulnerable to the attack of the power structures that are existing in their world, and no way to really defend themselves uh, because they don't have that much of a following. I mean, on the day of Pentecost, there's 120 uh, hiding behind a locked door, and and the Holy Spirit comes, and then the church explodes and fills Jerusalem in just uh, a short time. But that's neither here nor there. What are these channels of communication that we see opened up between Jesus and these disciples on the road to Emmaus? What are these uh, channels of communication that we can open up when we are in a time of uncertainty? And I think uh, we can look at Luke chapter 24, and we can see four channels of communication that uh, that are, I think, maybe, well, I, I think there are definitely things that we should consider uh, making a practice in our own life, especially in times of uncertainty, as these disciples found themselves in. And, and the first channel that we need to open up is to just walk with Jesus, just to be with Jesus, to to walk with Him. And we see these these disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus comes to them. Now, uh, these might be a little bit below the surface; these channels, but I think that they are ultimately there and it's not an accident that they're there and we can we can see them and we can take some lessons from them about how we should uh what channels we can we can maybe open up and so first of all we need to walk with Jesus channel number 1 is to walk with Jesus and and that requires us to be on the same page if we're going to walk with someone we have to be on the same page with them and I get that from Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? And ultimately what that takes on our part is to agree with God, agree with God that he is right, that he is Lord, that he is sovereign, that he is in control, to agree with God, to submit to his rule over our life. And we have to come to a point of repentance, repenting of our own control, uh, changing our mind. That's the word that's translated repentance in the New Testament literally means change your mind. And so we have to change our mind about who's in control, who's Lord, who's sovereign, who's calling the shots, who's in charge. And we, we change our mind. We repent and we believe that Jesus is in control, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is calling the shots. And then once we agree, we're, we're agreeing with God. We're changing our mind. God, you were right. We were wrong. And once we agree, then we can walk with God. Can two walk together lest they be agreed? Amos chapter 3, verse 3. And so once we are agreed with God, we can walk with Jesus. And, and when we walk with Jesus in times of uncertainty, I, I think it's important for us to, to come to Jesus with no agenda, to come to Jesus and to worship him for who he is as lord of the universe and as sovereign of creation and as when we talk about lord the one in charge i mean ultimately that's the idea of lordship we want to come to him and worship him for who he is not what he gives and when we worship jesus for what he gives that's a subtle form of idolatry worshiping the gift rather than the giver and so we want to worship Jesus for who he is. We want to walk with Jesus for who he is, not what he gives. No agenda. We want to wait. We want to abide. We want to just be with him, to just walk with him and, and, to, and, and to appreciate him for who he is. And ultimately, that knowledge of who Jesus is comes from reading his word, the inspired record of his life and his ministry and the implications of it in the later epistles and and the backstory of it in the in the Old Testament and the law and the prophets. So channel number 1 is we want to walk with Jesus. 
Channel number two is we want to talk with Jesus. We want to pray honestly. <laughs> you want to you want a, a model of honest prayer? You can look up uh, some psalms. They're called the imprecatory psalms, and that's a model of honest prayer. There's some very uh, honest prayers in there that might be difficult for some of us to hear, but it's a model of the fact that we can approach God and we can tell Him how we're feeling, and we can we can pray honestly with him. We can be real and transparent and honest. And ultimately, when we're not real and transparent and honest with God, we're not hiding anything from him. He He knows our hearts. But I think we need to talk with Jesus. These disciples, they walked with Jesus, and then they talked with Jesus. We need to pray honestly. We need to talk to Jesus about what's concerning us. We need to come to him with our burdens. It says in in 1 Peter, I believe it is, cast your cares on Christ for he cares for you. We need to cast our cares on Christ and to trust him to help us carry the load, to walk with us through it, to be with us in it. You know, that's what Jesus promised. He didn't promise an ease of life. He didn't promise anything but his presence. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that was, as I said, post-resurrection, after he had spent the last week of his life stirring up trouble in Jerusalem, and he was telling them to go into all the world and, and preach the gospel to all of creation. And part of that great commission, that command that he gave them, was a reminder that he was Lord and that he was with them even when things got difficult. And then the book of Acts bears that out, Jesus' presence with the church when things were tough. So first, we need to walk with Jesus. That's the first channel of communication we can open. The second channel of communication we can open is to talk with Jesus. We walk with Jesus with no agenda. We worship him for who he is, not what he can give. We talk with Jesus. We pray honestly. We talk to him about what is concerning us, and we ask him to intervene in those situations. Channel number three is that we hear Jesus. We listen to Jesus. We hear Jesus. Matthew chapter 22, verses 31 and 32 says this, But concerning, this is Jesus speaking, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And what I, why I read that, what I wanted to share with you there is Jesus is saying, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? So as we open the Bible, and we read it, especially when we read it out loud, we are hearing the voice of God. That's that's God's voice. Not the latest devotional, not the latest YouTube or Instagram famous preacher, but the Word of God right there in the Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit. We read it aloud. That's the voice of God that we can hear. So we need to have as high a view of Scripture as Jesus did and realize that when we hear the Bible preached and when we hear the Bible read, we are hearing the voice of God. Now, not everything every preacher has ever said is the voice of God speaking, obviously. We are human. We mess up. We misspeak. We say things that aren't correct. But in so much as we communicate the truth of the Word of God, and in so much as we read clearly and honestly and truthfully the Word of God, God takes that and applies it to the heart of the believer and calls them to faith and repentance, deeper deeper trust in Jesus and deeper repentance of their sin and more closely following Him, walking with Him in agreement, walk with Jesus, talk with Jesus. Third channel, hear Jesus. And the fourth channel is to listen to Jesus. And we see here that 
the disciples were hearing Jesus. They were hearing him. And if you've got kids, you understand the difference between hearing and listening. They heard Jesus. They heard what he had to say, exposing all that the law and the prophets had to say about him, that the Old Testament really points us to Jesus. And they they heard him. But they didn't understand. They didn't listen until he broke bread with them. And there's, I mean, there's sermon upon sermon in that reality alone, the idea that communion, the idea that the Lord's Supper, the idea that that fellowship with God and one another around the Lord's table is a key to understanding and to knowing and to hearing and to responding to Jesus is that's filled with meaning. But we're not going to expound on that today. I just want to to point out the difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is information coming in, it's being assimilated, it's being understood for what it said. The words that actually went forth are are heard and, and understood. But listening is the intent to obey. I listened. I wanted to hear from him so that I could do what he said. And it was in, as I said, the breaking of bread that they were, that they they finally understood what was going on. In verse 30, it says, Now as it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered, saying, the Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. All this stuff that we've been trying to wrap our heads around that we've seen the last few hours, it's real. Simon really did encounter him. And they told they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. They had intent to obey. So we are facing uncertainty in our in our world. I mean, this is really a, a pandemic that's having a, a global impact, at least in uh, economic situations and and starting to really have an impact in agriculture, shutting down slaughterhouses and facilities that the supply chain of agriculture depends on. And I'm, I am subject to these same uncertainties. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the future holds. But what comes to my mind in this discussion is the event of the disciples in the boat with Jesus in the stormy sea, and they wake Jesus up and say, don't you care that we're perishing? And and Jesus, you know, in his, his own winsome way says, you, you have little faith, or however he words it, and calms the storm. And as I said earlier, Jesus' promise in the Great Commission after all the uncertainty that they had been thrust into, wasn't that they were going to be successful or wasn't that they were going to have an easy life. In fact, um, 11 or 10, depending on how you count, not counting Judas, (laughs) 10 of the 11 that were left died a martyr's death, according to church history, violent martyr's deaths. And, And the 11th, John, the the revelator, John the Apostle, author of the book of John, author of the first, second, and third epistles of John, author of the book of Revelation. Church history tells us that his lack of death wasn't for lack of, of trying by the Roman government. In fact, he wrote the John John wrote his book of Revelation the Revelation of Jesus Christ. He wrote that from the Isle of Patmos in political exile according to church history, after they had boiled him in oil and tried to pull him in two, he was exiled. 
So it wasn't for lack of trying. So it wasn't a promise from Jesus that everything was going to be easy or everything was going to be good. It was a promise from Jesus that he would be with them. And so are you walking with Jesus? Are you agreed with him? Have you repented of the sin you're aware of? Have you entered into a relationship? Do you believe? Do you trust him? Are you talking to him about the things that concern you? Are you praying honestly? Are you hearing his word? And are you listening with intent to obey? I think those are some channels of communication that we can open up when we deal with some difficult times. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for a time to examine your word. We just pray that as we examine your word, that it would examine us. We thank you for Jesus who sends us the Holy Spirit, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to apply these words to our hearts. We just pray for all the those that are facing difficult times, uncertain times, not being able to access markets, not being able to access slaughter facilities, uh, difficult economy, difficult just difficulty and uncertainty everywhere. Pray that you would reveal your your trustworthiness to them and that they would respond to you in repentance and faith. We thank you for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.